Hi, everybody. Welcome to the New York Comic Con Lock and Key panel for 2020. Um, thank you for joining us for this today. And um, thank you for joining my two panelists, Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez, creator of the Lock and Key. Hi, Chris. Hi, Joe. Chris, Gabe, it's great to see you. Everyone who tuned in, it's so great to see you. I can't really, but I can pretend. Yeah, so let's let's talk about this. Um, Lock and Key. So Lock and Key ended its official run in 2013, but along the way, there's been there's been a bit of dabbling, and so this year has really been the first time that the series has returned in a a monthly ish way um, mm, yeah. with in Pale Battalions Go. So a month ago, people experienced the start of that, um, and now this week, issue two came out. So. Joe, let's start with you. If you want to catch people who haven't uh, haven't read Impale Battalions Go, um, what this is and why this is important beyond just the story being told in this miniseries. Right. Well, first of all, you know, we did, we told a complete story with the original six books in Lock and Key, but, you know, it's kind of my home away from home. Um, and I'm always thinking about the house and the families that have lived there. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of history in that house and a lot of stories we've never told that I feel are interesting in their own right. So we have been dabbling. We have told some stories largely about Chamberlain Locke and his children um, who occupied the house in the earliest part of the 20th century, the first three decades, four decades of the 20th century. And there's a story to tell there about World War I. The keys of Key House have always been used as weapons of war. And in 1915, one of the locks, Jack Locke, uh, wants to get in it. He wants to get in the fight and feels that it is their job, almost their duty, to use the keys to turn the tide of the war. And uh, Chamberlain Locke, his father, who is a philosophical man, wants to see the end to war um, and refuses to uh, allow his son to participate, um, which is, you know, also excellent parenting since his kid is just 14. <laughs> Amazing. Um, uh, he's unable though to, uh, Jack outmaneuvers him and winds up getting over to Eeps in Belgium um, just in time for the first use of uh, poison gas um, on a, you know, on a battlefield. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of historical fiction, and I love that I'm that we've been able to use lock and key to reflect upon different moments in world history and American history. Um, I'm really excited that issue two is just out. Um, I have to say, I, you know, for myself, I think it's it's maybe one of the two or three most beautiful issues Gabe has ever drawn. Um, you know, he's, Gabe, you know, um, is, uh, is always brilliant in my opinion, but maybe in issue two, he's raised his game even beyond anything we've seen before. Um, the level of historical accuracy, um, the, the emotional depth of the characters, their expressions, the way they stand. Um, and for myself, in terms, you know, as a guy who writes comic book scripts, it's the happiest I've been with a comic book script since we wrote the last issue of Lock and Key, Alpha and Omega. So I'm really excited for people to get it. It's really something to see that, that this far into the 13 years into telling Lock and Key stories that you both have delivered, like you say, probably your finest work. Um, so the, the first 13 years were good sort of honing your craft. And now I think you've oh, finally, uh, just about mastered it. Um, you know, Keith Richards has this thing, they've been around for 50 years, you know, and he says about the Stones, we're just getting started, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I kind of love that. Sometimes I think, sometimes I think, you know, with Lock and Key that, you know, um, uh, the first six books were just the prologue, but we're just getting started. And so, Gabe, for you, for, before we get into the World War I setting, um, when you revisit Key House decades prior to the main story that you've told and sort of the main architecture and furniture that you built into that version of the house, what is your approach to telling a story set, you know, a half century earlier or more? You know, how do you, how much of the house do you keep intact and how much do you look to sort of give period details as far as the furniture and, and you know, how much continuity do you like to see in what you're doing then and now? 
Well, we try to keep it as consistent as possible. In a way, when, when we envisioned the story, I remember right after we finished working on Welcome to Lovecraft, the first arc of the first big story of Lock and Key, Joe took a while to wrote a, a, a backstory Bible of the Lock family with a little hints here and there, even that early on, about the past of the family. What was the origin of the keys? Uh, where did the locks get access to them? And then we got a few hints about the Revolutionary War um, era time in which the locks discovered the Whispering Iron. And that's something that we developed later when we introduced each of the keys at the ending of the book. Then we decided to use that part of the book to build uh, brick by brick a little bit of the story of the past of the locks and how they made the keys uh, play a role in history and throughout historical events. So from then on, I think we, we had this idea that the key house itself has uh, had a certain presence throughout time that has to be consistent in the way in which the family developed, in which the keys developed and the house itself developed. So I had this idea of the house uh, being originally a two or three stories uh, big house, but not the huge, almost a castle-like building that ended up being by the additions of each generation of the logs throughout the story. So in a way, it's an, an evolving character in itself. And it's great to finally uh, find a, a window of history in which to return to both Key House in the past and the past of the log family and explore that place. Because uh, this story is like, uh, Pale Battalions and what we did uh, previously in Open the Moon and Small World and other short stories were like uh, little glimpses at that past and ended up evolving in becoming a big story in itself. And that's really fun to see. In, in fact, Pale Battalions itself started like an idea we discussed for a single issue. And then we started developing concepts, ideas and, and everything. And it ended up becoming a, a three issue story that's going to be having a, a, an immediate sequel in, in the other thing that we will be developing right after Pale Battalions. So I, I just want to say, so there have been these standalone stories about Chamberlain Locke, like uh, Small World and Open the Moon. Um, I, but I do think that when they are all eventually collected together into a single book, which we anticipate will be called Locke and Key, The Golden Age, <clears throat> That, that, that even the standalone short stories will feel like chapters in a larger story, which mm -hmm. was what we did with, you know, um, the individual books in the original series. The other thing I was going to say is, um, Gabe just hit something that's important. Um, so there, every book of Lock and Key has had this guide to the known keys in the back, which shows the era in which various keys were developed um, and, and how they were, and gives some hints about how they were used in the revolution, in the civil war, um, in the beginning of the 20th century, all of which is really fun. But I wanna make a crucial point, which some people will like and some people will be angry about, okay? I love the Sherlock Holmes stories. I love Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. Arthur Conan Doyle was terrible about continuity. He, he in the first story, Watson got shot by a jazel bullet in his right shoulder. Later, it was his left shoulder. Later, it was his knee. Doyle didn't care enough to look back and, and see what he had said earlier. All he cared about was telling a great story. And I have to say that for myself, all I really care about is telling a great story. And, and so if there's something in the guide to the known keys that undermines a story I want to tell, I wouldn't hesitate to ignore it and then just revise the guide to the known keys uh, uh, later. Exactly. It might be harder for Gabe, who is. No, um, no, in a way, I, I've uh, sort of fought my obs uh, obsessive compulsive disorder of, of wanting to control all the details and keep them consistent and everything. And I think the the healing process started when we decided doing the the fourth volume of Lock and Key with a white spine instead of uh, a black one, and that certainly unnerved a lot of people that want to have all their books with the same spine. Right, everything. right. All and six I books have. I feel like I'm, I'm I'm getting over that kind of uh, stress, and even in fact the, in uh, in Pale Battalions itself, uh, the work of 
documentation and, and histor historical references is so extensive and, and, and exhausting that in a way I've been like, the way in which I, I dealt with the historical details uh, was always trying to adapt certain things in order to work better for the story itself. It's not a, probably a, a historian or a history teacher might find little details here and there that are not exactly as they are supposed to be in a historical record of World War I, but it's all put in the service of the ideas that we're telling in the story and the drama that we're trying to drive the characters through. So, so that's let's, a, let's talk about that part a bit more because in the first issue of In Pale Battalions Go, um, I think readers, the, the commentary was, hey, it's great to see Lock and Key back. That was a charming, kind of genteel story. And issue two, as people saw this week, is an entirely different thing. Um, I mean, there's always been, been some extreme horror throughout Lock and Key, but this is probably the most gripping, horrific issue that, that both of you have done. And it's all steeped in period details and real history. And so... For both of you, like what level of research and, and accuracy did you did you have to do to start that? And then, Gabe, for you, you know, drawing these kind of scenes while adhering to period details and the costuming and the settings is has to be a level above any kind of complication you've dealt with before in the series. Yeah, probably in this single issue, I have all the complications that I've faced in previous project combined in a single issue. It's a a thing about the scale of the situation, the 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 environment, uh, starting to consider that's a real place in which we place the story that has to be referenced through old photographs and stuff like that. And also it's a thing about, about the topic itself, because I remember we discussed uh, a few years ago with Joe, probably when we were in Pittsburgh, by the shooting of the first lock and key pilot, that if we ever wanted to do other stories for Lock and Key, one of the topics that we wanted to explore was the topic of war. Because I think, especially if you're telling horror story, there's, even in, in uh, supernatural fiction, there's nothing as closely as horrific as war it is. It's uh, of all the inventions that humankind has made is certainly the most horrible and the most tragic and the most dramatic and, and and it's a topic that I think every each uh, big work of fiction has to cover somehow so uh, to have the chance to return to, to to lock and key in order to reflect about the the problem of war which is something that we hope to keep developing in, in future stories of lock and key if we manage to to make war work key happen uh, is something that we've been thinking about from a, a long while. And I think this second issue of Pale Battalions is basically uh, jumping headfirst into that. It's, it, I think it's the, the largest piece of drama I've ever put on paper. And uh, I think it, it was a big responsibility to do it well because it, it was such a huge historical tragedy, the one that we're reflecting there. But also, we, we don't want the humanity of our characters to get lost in that. So to balance that, those two elements was like the greatest difficulty. And I think the way in which Joe crafted the amazing script that he wrote for this piece is uh, something that it's just a, a thing to be studied. I think it's, uh, it's one of the most amazing pieces of comics writing I, I've ever read and I hope that the art uh, made it uh, justice because it, it's a sort of responsibility on it. In terms of the horror of the, the, the issue, there's a panel Gabe drew where two, two German soldiers are investigating a mystery um, they have heard there's a rumor that shadows are getting up and moving around on Hill 60 um, on at one part of the battlefield. So they go to they go to investigate, talk to the soldiers there about what's happening. And then uh, they're having a drink as daylight fails. And one of them looks into a tree and crouched in the tree wearing the angel wing harness and the crown of shadows is Jack Locke with his eyes burning with hatred. And the shadows around him, around the trunk of the tree, are just beginning to rise up in the shape, shape of wolves. 
um, and and uh, uh, evil little goblins. And um, I think it's one of the most shocking, it's a totally silent panel, and I think it's one of the scariest and most shocking panels Gabe has ever done. It hits, there's a panel a lot of people talk about in the first book of Welcome to Lovecraft, um, when people talk about whether you can be scary in comics. You know, there's a panel in, in Welcome to Lovecraft where Bodhi has turned his head and he's looking through the bars of the well house and he's shouting something to Kinsey and he doesn't see that Dodge is coming out of the well behind him. And for me, this, this panel is like, this panel lands like that, you know, it's, it's, um, and there's something terrifying about seeing the keys. We're so used to the Locke family using the keys for good. And there's something really jarring about seeing the keys in the hands of someone who means to do grievous harm to others. Um, that's a real, I mean, it's right there with, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis talking on the phone and out of focus right behind her, you know, you see Michael Myers in the mask. It's really like, oh my God. And then, so beyond beyond just the, the real world horrors in the comic, um, you introduce a new key that, that makes its comic universe appearance for the first time too. Yeah, and that was fun. I mean, and Gabe had such a great design for it. You know, it's the, the matchstick key turns up in lock and key. Um, the matchstick key was actually first introduced in um, the very first episode of the Netflix Lock and Key. So it never appeared in the comics before, but it's in, we wrote it into, uh, Aaron Collette and I wrote it into the first script for Lock and Key number one. Um, and, and I just thought, you know, a key this beautiful, so well designed by Gabe, it's got to be there. It's got to be in the house. And so we brought the match, we see the first use of the matchstick key um uh, in issue two of in pale battalions go we may later discover why the matchstick key has never been seen in the modern day mm -hmm. at some point down the road there may be an explanation for why that key never turned up in the comic book timeline the comic book timeline and the tv timeline the two stories are are meshed together um but are different they have you know the same characters the same spirit, the same keys, the same locations, but yeah. uh, reconfigured differently, which I think is fun. Yeah, they share the same family tree, but they are in different branches, and you, you can climb and explore each of them and have fun in, in there. And, and the way the way Gabe and Colors J Photos brought that particular key to life in the comic yes. is just yeah it's amazing and horrific and beautiful all at once. Um, okay, so on Pale Battalions Go, like Gabe mentioned, it was it was originally pitched as a single issue sort of thing, but I think we've all done this long enough that when, when Joe mentions anything about lock and key, you sort of pencil in the length and the page count and it develops along the way. Um, so it became three issues of, of varying page counts, but it's also all uh, lead into something potentially even bigger and, and at least more, more broadly attention getting, I think, because this is the first ever crossover that we've ever done with lock and key. So I don't know how much you want to sort of talk about the particulars here and where it goes, but this leads into the big crossover, Hell and Gone, with the Sandman universe. Yeah, it's probably our last crossover, too, because it's very hard to imagine justifying a crossover where, say, Tyler Lockme towered the duck. I mean, Gabe, Gabe did try a uh, My Little Pony crossover years ago, and there's a piece of art that exists that shows that, but I think right, that's I remember. probably more appropriate. Yeah, with, with the goat. With the devil goat and the and the pony from Cogworks, yeah. Abe, do you want to tackle what our thinking was going into Lock and Key Sandman? Uh, well, I I think we we started this idea as a joke somehow because I uh, I think we we discussed at some point that I I've been uh, obsessed with doing a story that could be like our version of uh, Dante's Inferno of the Divine Comedy. And uh, I thought that one of the lock characters should uh, find a way to, to visit hell, making a key to hell. And then I remember, I think you said, uh, what if it could be the hell from Sandman? And, right. and there's the key to hell, insistence of mist and everything. And we started joking about this idea, uh, assuming that it would never be possible to do this story. 
And as, as years go, went by, we, we finally found a way to, to make the story work in terms of the, of the, of, of the mythology of both uh, the Lot family and, and the Sandman uh, mythology. And uh, we got incredibly lucky that both uh, IW and DC Comics got excited about it because uh, for us to, to have the chance to play with the, this uh, sandbox, sandbox never uh, more accurately used, uh, it, it's great because uh, at least for me, and I'm pretty sure for you as well, uh, the, the comics that uh, Vertigo published in the 90s uh, in a way cemented our loves for comic books as a way of, uh, of crafting stories. Uh, it, pieces like Sandman itself and Alan Moore's Swamp Thing and, uh, and Hellblazer and many other graphic novels from, from that time really uh, uh, bonded our, our love for comics in a way we, we hadn't experienced before. So having the chance to tell a story that for us is important with these characters, which certainly had a, a, an incredibly, an indelible uh, mark in our creative souls. Uh, it's great. It's, it's a way to say thank you to everyone that has influenced us and formed us as comic storytellers, trying to come up with a story that honors the, the, the memory of their work and hopefully will help us drive a story to an interesting play that's going to be exciting for the readers. Just to, to have the chance to deal with these characters and and giving them life in, in inside the cosmos of, of Key House and the Locks, it's incredibly rewarding and exciting. And I, I just, uh, I already did a cover uh, for the first issue of the crossover in which we had to do our own versions of characters that we certainly love from the Sandman universe. And I just can't wait to just uh, take my, my hands into, the, into that creative play and make something amazing out of it. And so, Joe, for you to, to enter that world, how much of the story changed along the way to where you knew what you wanted to do, but then when you got into it, you started finding yourself wanting to grab this character and that character and play with all these different Sandman universe characters? Yeah, I mean, you know, so Gabe is right. I mean, it really started as he wanted to bring one of the locks to hell. And I, I flashed to a memory of Seasons of Mist, and I thought to myself, you know, that key that Lucifer gives to Morpheus in Seasons of Mist, the key to the gates of hell, that must be made out of whispering iron. Don't you think it has to be made out of whispering iron? And, and from the seed of that came the whole idea of doing a crossover. And, and, you know, I'm writing the scripts now, and I have to admit I've been surprised at how well the two worlds mesh. Um, they ease into one another as if they were always meant, as if they've always been adjacent. Um, and I think for me, um, in Pale Battalions Go, all the stories from Small World, Open the Moon, and through In Pale Battalions Go that tell the story of Chamberlain Locke's family continue on into the Sandman universe crossover. And, and for me, my goal is, so, so as a kid, I could never resist a great crossover. If the DC characters were going to meet the Marvel characters, I was there. But grown-up me knows that most of those comics actually weren't very good, <laughs> that they were sort of shameless fan service in which there were actually no stakes, and the whole point was just to see, you know, uh, what would happen if um, Hulk took on Superman or whatever, you know? And, and, and that's not really where I live, you know? I mean, I really want to tell stories that have emotional weight, um, that, that land... Um, psychologically and emotionally that take the reader somewhere and make them feel something besides, oh, cool. I mean, that's great. Oh, cool is a great reaction. You want that too. But that's like the starting point. There has to be more. Um, and so, so um, you know, the question was, could we tell a story that would uh, kind of end the tale of Chamberlain Locke's um, family, you know, of their time in Key House? Could we tell a story that does that that also honors the terrific work of Neil Gaiman and his many artistic collaborators, Dave McKean and, and you know, Sam Keith. And it's just a, you know, it's a, a absolutely murderous row of tremendous artists. Could we do something that honors that work, um, which we love so much 
and and which sort of taught us that we could tell us that we could do a story like Lock and Key. I don't think if if not for Sandman and Swamp Thing, um, I don't know if there would be a Lock and Key because I just don't think that I would have any sign. You know, we would have we wouldn't have a map. We wouldn't have landmarks to show us that we're heading in the right direction. You know, we learn from them. Yeah, when I when I imagine the the prospect of of making a living out of drawing comics, the first thing that drove me was, I want one day to be able to tell a story like Sandman. And I remember the thought that crossed my mind when I got the first script of Lock and Key was, this is it, this is the story that I was waiting for to to create this thing I wanted to do, driven by what those stories inspired me to be. And as Joe said, uh, crossovers are, are complicated, but I think what uh, uh, makes us more confident about this one is that it actually came out of an idea that we have for a story. We didn't want to make a crossover for the sake of it, but we got this idea for a story, and then we asked, what if it is a story in which we can invite these other characters and this universe to be a part of it? And that said, that said, I, I think we can do something that will permanently be part of Sandman lore. <laughs> I think we can, I think we can, we can, we can, we can put our filthy fingerprints um, on, on one little part of the Sandman universe forever. And I kind of love that. So, so we've been, we've been yapping for a little while here and but we haven't announced anything yet. So talking about Sandman, we should probably make some kind of a cool announcement here for everybody. Um, and before I do that, part of the lead into the announcement is just a big thank you, not only to Neil Gaiman for the support yes. and the, the permission and sort of the conversations he's been having with Joe about the scripts and everything, but also with DC Comics, who, you know, they're doing a big Sandman TV show right now. And, and often when something elevates to that form, it, it can sort of complicate the, the ability to play with properties in fun ways. And it hasn't here. DC has been very permissive and, yeah. welcoming to this whole crossover and along those lines they've given us and through us skeleton crew studios permission to actually create the key to hell um lock and key fans will know that skeleton crew studios has been making these amazing replica keys of basically every key that exists so far um and so there will be an actual key to hell which i think when we announced the series beyond people's request to see various characters, that was the next question was, will there be a key to hell? Will there be a key to right. hell? There will be a key to hell that, you know, is Gabe's design following the designs laid down by Kelly Jones? Yeah, yeah, and it's going to be, and uh, we are, uh, we already discussed with uh, Easy Skeleton, the details of the proper scale and, uh, and the full, uh, a, a fully laid uh, uh, art guide to do the, the actual piece. So hopefully it will be able to get in people's hands very soon, but it's going to be an impressive piece of craft. How big is it, Gabe, again? I'm working on this script now. Yeah, it's about 10 inches long. Uh, so like, like four on the length. A, a little shorter, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's almost a weapon more, more than a key. Is, but, yeah. is, is, won't be that big, it's not to scale. Uh, yeah, no, but uh, we're trying to make it as as one on one scale as possible. Oh, really? Is that true? No. Is it going to be that big? Yeah, it should be something like this. Chris, I mean, we, we, did, we did just do the giant key at, uh, yeah. so I think there he might play with it a bit. But yeah, I mean, that's it's exciting. Oh, that's I don't wild. That's that, awesome. That, uh, I don't recommend that the people that buy that particular key use it, but that's yeah. that's up to each uh, <laughs> each user. Um, so let's see. So from there, let's segue then quickly to our own TV show, which is Lock and Key. Um, season two is just underway that uh, I believe they just started shooting a couple weeks ago. And so that's exciting that, that you know, after the, the needed delay with, with the world situation, that they're yeah. able to go back and safely tackle season two. So that's, that's very exciting. I'm tremendously excited and I'm so glad they're back up there shooting and, and that we get to tell more stories about Key House and, you know, and the Netflix is making it happen. Um, but, you know, um, if I were to say anything about what's going to happen in the season, Netflix would land a black helicopter out <laughs> behind the house and pull a sack over my head and I'd never be heard from again. Um, but I will say that, that Carlton Cuse and Meredith Avril just, you know, just knocked it out of the park. I'm so excited by what they've done. And, and you know, I think it's going to be, 
um, like season one times 10. <laughs> um, all right, well, I think we're, we're close to winding down, but so one more thing before we, before we wrap here today is you also did some new covers for sort of the ultimate, ultimate collection of the modern day Locke family story. The first six volumes of Locke and Key are now being compiled in what we've called Keyhouse Compendium. Yeah. And it's basically one of those thousand page collections of, of all the stories in one. And so on that, what did you, how did you want to approach the cover for that to make it something special and different from all the other collected editions that you've done covers for? So what we, we tried to do something that was like simple and iconic as much as possible in order to honor the characters and the mythology of Lock and Key in a way it became such a distinctive visual universe on its own by the way in which the story held this uh, vision of a world evolved that it, it was like a really, it felt really fun and natural the way in which the idea for the cover came out and, and how it works as a compendium. It's a, uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out in which, uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> but it's, uh, that's the back, the back cover, the back cover drawing. So just to my have, iPad wallpaper forever. Yeah. <laughs> to have just this keyhole in which uh, we pe we just peer through it to figure out the entire universe that's hidden behind that that lock is the way in which you you get into the story in, in this book. So being able to to have the chance to do these illustrations and the design for the compendium in order to make it a a. a a solid unit. It's uh, it's great. It, it's great to when when you look back at all the work that you did in those years it was almost seven years of our lives in which we worked day after day into that single story and and to look it with a more mature eyes and and figure and, and realizing how much a story is still there to be explored was uh, incredibly exciting. I th I think it was a, a a great way to get back to to the story that we founded a few years ago to realize how much we can keep exploring in this world. With that, I think we are just about out of time. So before we part, gentlemen, I just want to say it's always great to see both of you and hear from both of you. It's my first ever, you know, big panel one that I've done without wearing pants. So it's been pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, New York Comic, yeah, Comic Con, if you can great. slap a rated R on this for uh, adults only. Um, Thank you very much for hosting us and for all of you for tuning in after, you know, you've, you've watched Zoom panels and, and things for endless months. And so we appreciate your patronage here. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. See you.